Last month, when I left the yacht that my Kofi subscribers have paid for to come landside for supplies, I saw in the TVs of my local Waitrose that we are getting a Warhammer 40,000 TV show. Games Workshop and Amazon are currently in the process of formalising the creative guidelines around the 40k IP, and then we'll be off to the races with a budget that could launch a man into space. Now, I generally don't like to assume what goes on in the boardrooms of giant corporations, but I have a sneaking feeling that while they drink bottled water and eat sushi off of naked women, both parties are about to discover a really unpleasant truth about each other. And that truth is that you can make an authentic TV show that meets the creative guidelines that Games Workshop sets for their 40k universe, or you can make a good TV show. I don't know, maybe I'm being too negative off the bat. Maybe we should just bask in this moment of glory when things look like they are moving in the right direction for the mass social acceptance of our hobby. But there are a number of pitfalls that Games Workshop and Amazon could easily fall into that could ruin both the show and potentially the future of the precious 40k IP in general. The first thing that comes to mind here is that we might run smack bang into the Judge Dredd death spiral. The first Judge Dredd film actually made money in cinemas, believe it or not. The 2008 DIP had enough public interest that people were curious about it, and when they saw that it had a big star attached, people went to see it. Sound familiar, right? It was also terrible. People hated it. However, the IP was rebooted, and Dread was actually a good film. Plus, it cost half as much as the original to make. Therefore, it should have been like printing money, right? No, it made half as much as the Stallone version, because once the casual moviegoer saw what Judge Dredd was, or at least what Judge Dredd was made out to look like the first time around, they didn't want to see it again. Granted, this might have been either because of a reduced budget, or that it didn't have a big name attached. Carl Urban, Olivia Thirlby and Lena Headley were all much smaller stars in 2012. But if a movie studio is only just breaking even when you adapt 2080's premier character, why bother adapting anything else from them? And in fact, why bother using their IP in the first place? You might think I'm overblowing the situation here. After all, Games Workshop is much larger than 2000 AD and isn't intrinsically linked to a medium in decline. Yet, insert an ominous pause for the viewer to consider the future of miniature wargaming while I flash the word Hornby across the screen multiple times. Sorry, I'm just reading my visual cues here. But wait, I hear you say, there are loads of stories to tell in the 40k universe. Look at the hundreds of books the Black Library has under its belt, the comics, the stuff on Warhammer Plus. The trouble is, there is a difference between books and screen. Otherwise, we'd be drowning in films about Judge Dredd, The Green Lantern and John Carter. The full six book Dune series would have been successfully adapted multiple times already and would occupy the same social strata as Game of Thrones. We'd have already extended that Dawn of War cutscene that everyone loves into 90 minutes and the world would be full of sunshine and rainbows. And yes, it's true that there are loads of decent stories in the 40k universe. A lot of people want to see the Horus Heresy, a lot want to see Eisenhorn, I want to see the entire Badab War recreated in painstaking detail over the course of a 26 part documentary, exactly like the 1973 World at War series narrated by Laurence Olivier. But all these people, including me, are wrong. Allow me to elaborate. Imagine sitting down at the TV to watch the first trailer. Yes, Grandma, this is the hobby I was telling you about. You know, the one that's so good for mental health. You'll be telling her that as the Space Marine bisects a chaotic spawn with his whirring chainsaw. No, really, you'll try and continue. Loads of people say this hobby is great for practicing mindfulness. Painting these is almost like meditating. You'll finish your sentence just as the expensive Amazon TV budget shows the slow motion impact of an explosive bolt round against soft human flesh. Can't we watch Baby Yoda instead? She'll protest as the screen starts to resemble an explosive decompression in a strawberry jam factory? No, Grandma, you'll say. The Mandalorian was good for one, maybe two seasons at most, and now all the emotional beats have been used up, it's unable to find a new creative direction. Your conversation will naturally detour into why Baby Yoda was actually using Jedi mind tricks to control the Mandalorian anyway, and then you'll leave, reminding yourself to leave it an extra week before visiting her in their care home again. I mean, sure, these days, movie and TV producers can get away with something as unusual as Arcane on Netflix or a movie about the Pokemon. The IP between these properties is going to be way over the head of Grandma, but she's going to understand that these things are based on computer games, and people understand computer games. It's no longer the 90s where people were mocking Bill Gates for explaining the internet on TV. Professional footballers go home and play more football on their computers. Everyone gets it. But let's look at what happened when people tried to understand miniature wargaming. This is a quote from a BBC article describing the hobby. 
collectors build large forces of miniature plastic gaming models, which can cost more than £100 each. A miniature can be made up of hundreds of pieces, which must be fitted together and then painted with colours such as flesh and bone. Technically this is correct, but it's written in such a way that it makes it look like miniature wargamers occupy a space in the social order right in between adult men who never marry but yet have an extensive knowledge of Japanese schoolgirl anime and people who pay to see deathmatch wrestling. We've all seen the clip from the Graham Norton show where he mocks Henry Cavill for playing Warhammer. If you're not British or you haven't been following this man's career, you've got to remember that humiliation is Graham Norton's go-to mode of comedy. I'm sure that's never going to be a problem in the future. And then flash that screenshot of the Vince McMahon scandal again on the screen. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm reading the visual cues again. And finally, who can forget heroin for middle class nerds? How Warhammer conquered gaming. And that's The Guardian. It comes to something when The Guardian is taking shots at us. Of all the newspapers, this is the one that's supposed to be on our side. It's like watching the ball boy start hazing the players at Wimbledon. This is the audience of people we are dealing with here. And this is the audience that a Warhammer show has to appeal to to gain major viewing numbers. Board gaming is fine. Now we've cast off the shadow of Monopoly at Christmas, normal people have discovered that if you stick a party game like Werewolf or Mafia on TV, it turns into a huge hit. Board gaming is approachable and easy to understand. Even role players have managed to overcome the stigma attached to them. Stage 1, get loads of attractive people to play D&D on YouTube. Stage 2, play into the D&D adjacent Stranger Things TV show. Boom, suddenly D&D is allowed again. It's just outside of our very specific bubble. People don't know or don't want to know about this weird hobby of ours. I've had many a conversation with people that just can't grok the idea that you can take a plastic sprue, assemble it, paint it and then play a game with it. Their brains just lock up like I've admitted to sexual antics with a dog. The irony here is that many of those people could name the entire starting lineup and match history of their favourite sports team leading back several decades. And this is a problem even if the TV show is good. I have a terrifying vision that the spotlight will shine upon this hobby and it will reveal that the Emperor is not only not wearing any clothes, but is well past his prime, covered in pizza boxes and furiously typing a dissertation about why Space Marines shouldn't be female. Problem number two is that the Warhammer 40,000 universe itself is unadaptable. The entire thing is a parody on venerating idols, stagnation, anti-progress, anti-technology and indoctrinated xenophobia. Everyone speaks of the Emperor and the Golden Throne but the viewer can't see it. The technology is barely understood. There is little to no education. Alien species and warp entities are so lethal that exposure to them means instantly losing your mind followed seconds later by your life. The universe looks like a more extreme version of 1984 and if we were talking about unadaptable books, this would be the first one on the list. Although if Winston Smith jumped books, he would likely be asking if he could go back to Room 101 within five minutes. The thing is, loads of films incorporate these kinds of oppressive fantasy worlds in them, mainly teen fiction, things like Divergent and The Hunger Games. Although what happens in these worlds is that a character appears that overturns the existing order and creates a new world together with a band of ragtag renegades. However, I'm pretty sure that those creative guidelines don't allow our plucky young heroine and the Scooby gang to overturn the Imperium. You could get a 90 minute film out of it, but it would have a very dark ending and there wouldn't be a sequel. Another problem to work around is that in order to make a good show, you need two key things that the modern 40k universe is extremely lacking in. Interpersonal conflict and character growth. Interpersonal conflict drives stories. The Horus Heresy is a great setting for this, as the interpersonal conflict in the beginning drives the story forwards. You have different personalities in the Space Marine Legions, and different legions rubbing up against each other, along with various war journalists needed to provide a normal human perspective to the action. It's why the first trilogy of books are so well regarded. However, Amazon would need to choose between faithfully adapting the 64 book series and building a working Dyson Sphere around the sun. They don't have the budget to do both. In the modern 40k setting, they there is almost no interpersonal conflict left to have, or at least none that you can base a story around. Sure, you can have a group of characters discovering a new alien race or possessed group of humans, and everyone yells out a battle cry and starts chopping each other up. Maybe the wise cracking gunslinger sidekick can offer his doubts as to the Emperor's divinity to the Inquisitor, and then the Inquisitor can shoot him. But what do you do with the remaining 95% of the runtime? Plus, how do you ease the casual viewer into it? Every successful sci-fi, and to some extent fantasy, has followed the fish out of water scenario of a person being taken from a relatively sheltered existence and slowly introduced into the world so that the viewer sees it through their eyes. But you really get those scenarios in 40k. 
You can have a group of 12 year olds being taken through the initiation process to become a space marine or sister of battle, but that process could only really take about a maximum of 30 minutes of screen time unless you really want to derail what the series is about. Plus, those stories generally work as part of an overall theme about a person growing up and maturing into a functional human, rather than the finale having them turned into a quasi-fascistic murder machine. And talking about everyone's favourite murder machines, I think we're sliding into issue number three, the space marine problem. Space Marines are a double-edged sword. There's no way on God's green earth that Games Workshop and Amazon would agree to do a 40k show and not include Space Marines. They are the Pikachu of the hobby, the most obvious visual reminder of what Warhammer is. But once we get into the Venn diagram of contains authentic Space Marines, is approachable to a wide audience, and has enough content to fit out 6 to 10 45 minute long episodes, the middle intersection is going to be emptier than my bank account the day after an Imperator class Titan is released. The problem you're going to run into is that Space Marines are incredibly boring pretty much by design. Sure, you can read those little blurbs in the Forge World books about the battles they get into and how they totally killed that planet and its population stone dead, but once you zoom down to squad level combat, they are incredibly rigid and limited in what they can do. A bolt gun here, a chain sword there and you're done. Out of combat they hang around in groups of similar people and eat and pray and train and have virtually no internal conflict. Oh and you know I mentioned characters having growth? I wasn't talking about those special injections the rock allegedly takes. Oh, you are feeling doubt, Mr. Astartes. Well, if you go and see the chaplain, he can read you a few pages from your storybook Why the Alien Must Die Before Bedtime. That's going to be a riveting 10 minutes. I could be watching Is It Cake instead. How do you make a Space Marine a sympathetic or likeable character? Most should have less charisma than a sports player in a post-match interview after they've suffered a drubbing loss. They don't care if they live or die, or if the people around them live or die. The only two things they care about is service to the Emperor and the honour of the chapter. You can absolutely have a group of unlikable misanthropes in your show, but they have to be entertaining misanthropes. Otherwise people will be switching to The Floor is Lava on Netflix. To make matters worse, I have a terrible feeling that at over six foot, Henry Cavill is going to be a space marine. And I don't mean that as a diss on the big HC. It means that they're going to have to find something for a space marine to do to fill out the majority of the show's runtime. No romance side plot here, I'm afraid. You absolutely can have the Superman fighting in combat, although you'll quickly burn through your budget and crucially the audience's attention span within 10 minutes. I should bring up the Smash YouTube series Astartes here, and yes, it managed to stylize the combat in such a way that it kept it entertaining, but that entire series totaled up at only 13 minutes, and only the first five was conventional fighting. The last eight minutes of the runtime was the Space Marine and the viewer trying to figure out what the giant chained up orb was and how they were going to deal with it. And Astartes is the high point of the genre. The history books are littered with terrible attempts to put Space Marines on screen. Least we forget Ultramarines the movie. As if I haven't hammered home this point enough, then you've got the issue of actually creating a realistic looking seven and a half foot tall armoured warrior. This isn't Halo or the Mandalorian. You can't just create an advanced cosplay outfit and get Cavill to slide it on every morning in between sips of his coffee. Space Marine physiology is completely different to humans, and as such you're going to need full CGI and extensive choreography just to get a full length shot of him walking down a hallway. But don't worry though. You can always fall back on that black humour the Warhammer universe is known for. The Imperial Infantryman's uplifting primer. Blood Bowl. Kyphus Kane. Imagine if you will. Our heroes are fighting against an overwhelming threat. The enemy is at the door and they are about to be overwhelmed. Their only hope is to get an ancient computer terminal working to open the escape hatch. And just as the tension ramps up, the tech priest appears and starts praying to the console in the slowest and most painfully drawn out way possible. Cut to a monster jumping on the space marine and getting blown away in a hail of bolt shells. Then cut back to the priest slowly reciting the catechism of awakening. Cut back to a heavy bolter firing until it runs out of ammo, the characters looking at each other nervously, and then cut back to the priest sprinkling ceremonial incense over it. If handled properly, that would make a good action scene. The humour is there. It's very easy to take an unapproachable subject, inject it with humour, 
and have a huge genre-defying hit. But what's the chance that that humour will make its way into the TV show? What's the chance that humour becomes a victim of those creative guidelines? In the 90s, the humour in the publications of Games Workshop was surgically extracted for reasons best known to the higher-ups of that period, as they wanted a more serious adult setting. You can still see the remains of it if you look hard enough, but it's in the corners of the fandom, and has been surpassed by the grimdark version of the 40k universe. And grimdark certainly has its place. I'm not talking about turning the whole show into slapstick comedy, but you have to have the characters see the absurd nature of the universe and occasionally comment on it. Bleakness for the sake of being bleak and edgy will get boring fast. You need a ray of light to emphasise the darker shadows. But it's going to be a balance. Oh yes, also, you remember that 20 minutes ago I mentioned the cinematic at the start of Dawn of War and wondered what would happen if you stretched out to a full feature film? Pariah Nexus answers that question. Spoilers ahead. People are generally risk averse in large companies, which is why that I always assumed that when Games Workshop were discussing Weimar TV, the conversation probably went along the lines of, we have a ton of writers and a ton of artists and a media studio, and we are already sticking loads of videos on YouTube. Let's combine them all with some original content, stick it up behind a paywall, add in a couple of exclusive miniatures a year, and if the subscriptions dry up, in future we can always sell the content to a streaming service. You just need a tentpole show and a bunch of other cheaper stuff for people to watch if they are interested. Pariah Nexus is that tentpole show. It's three episodes each, it's full of action, it shows off all the big hits of the modern 40k universe. You have a space marine, a sister of battle, some Cadians, and some death core. It ticks all the boxes of creative guidelines, and it's completely unapproachable to anyone who isn't a 40k superfan. To be fair, it is absolutely playing to an audience of superfans, but if this made its way onto Amazon, people's brains would melt. Who are the Necrons? Who is Illuminator Caesarus? Why is he torturing guardsmen? Why is he turned some Imperial Guard to zombies? Why does he not want to send more than one death mark to clean up some stragglers? Why does he appear via a giant green glowing hologram while the death mark is trying to be stealthy? Why is the Sister of Battle hallucinating some random guardswoman? Why does the Sister of Battle want to shoot some children in the head? Why does she stop wanting to shoot some children in the head a few seconds later? So many questions. But to make it clear, this isn't a pop at Warhammer Story Forge here. It's just that they are trying to adapt the unadaptable. They honestly have tried almost every trick in the book to get the characters to have some kind of internal conflict with one another. A sister of battle having a stress-induced breakdown is an interesting concept, but it needs far more time to pan out, and in compressing it over a limited runtime, it means that her extreme emotional swings come across as deranged. And to make it clear, this isn't a pop at M2 animation either. They just don't have the budget to be animating long conversations between multiple characters with loads of subtle expressions, or animating a five-minute scene explaining that the Death Corps have all been infected with Mind Shackle Scarabs. And yes, given the ratings on IMDB, I'm aware that mine is an unpopular opinion. If you want to tell me exactly how much you hate me now, why not sign up for my Ko-fi page for as little as £2 a month? You'll get to send me personal messages about why Pariah Nexus is great and I suck. I will absolutely see all of your messages, although I can't guarantee I will be sober enough to reply. As with many times I talk about the 40k universe, I keep cycling back to Star Wars, and that's because there are so many similarities. For instance, you can make a really good show these days using the Star Wars universe, but in order to do so, you have to strip away all the stuff that people have become conditioned to expect from it, and once you do that, you risk stripping away the viewers as well. Is it because liking stormtroopers and lightsabers makes you stupid? I'm not going to say that. I'm just going to heavily imply it. But in all honesty, the core audience for Star Wars just wants a middle-of-the-road sci-fi that they can sit down and watch with Grandma and the kids. Grandma isn't going to enjoy a roided-up super soldier reenacting the Texas Chainsaw Massacre every time he gets into a theological disagreement with someone. Lightsabers and blasters are much easier to portray on screen than chainsaws and bolt guns. And look at the state of that franchise now. I generally don't like painting too bleak a picture in my videos or speculating on the future too much. No one knows exactly how this is going to play out. It depends on who is attached to this project and their level of motivation and talent. It also depends on Henry Cavill's interpretation of the 40 universe. He might have a completely different take on it than you and I. After all, it is four decades of books, retcons, different time periods and different writing styles. That's a big strength for a hobbyist who can just pick and choose what they want, but a big negative when you have multiple producers trying to put together a single creative vision. Maybe this 40k series will be so good it will transcend the genre and create a new group of fans who have no intention of ever stepping foot in a shop but would gladly sit down to watch the next TV show featuring their favourite characters on screen.
or maybe your imagination paints a better picture of a chainsaw than any show could ever hope to do. No one enjoyed seeing how Darth Vader came to be. No one wants to see the inside of the sausage factory, except maybe the manager at the sausage factory. And to be fair, he's probably sick of it by now as well. If I haven't killed your enthusiasm for space marines, here's another video on them for you to watch, and I'll see you next time.